long time what happens. And you have higher rates of a variety of cancers. Um, and so that's probably the biggest thing. And so the FDA, oh, so th there's actually, uh, and it's, uh, there's like, there's, there's, it's, a, it's an emotional roller coaster, these videos. And it's actually, and the good news is finally the FDA, so for a long time China has capped their arsenic. They have a, they have a li legal limit, you can't have this much arsenic in rice, what are you, crazy? Um, but the US, of course, has a very powerful rice industry that um, has blocked it, but finally the FDA at least has, has capped rice for infant baby foods. Um, and so they're actually doing some good movement um, in that area, and yeah, yeah, yeah. But, oh, but it's interesting, but they're only looking at cancer risk, and they're very clear, it's saying, look, there's all sorts of non-cancer risks, health risks to arsenic, but if we'd spent our time doing that, we couldn't get the word out that, quick, you gotta stop giving little babies arsenic. Um, and so they're like, yeah, they're, but they're, they actually did a good job. Anyway. God, we can spend the whole time. I know maybe people want to go to other things. Whatever you want to do. Yeah. Does Tap and Amaranth have uh, arsenic? Oh, yeah. So uh, any other grain. So you move to any other grain. So it's just, so our, uh, so uh, the rice and wild rice are, are, are the two concerning. They're both these waterlogged plants grown in places with lots of arsenic, thanks to our um, bad pesticide history. And so move to anything else. Move to Tap, move to, to quinoa, move to, you know, whatever else you want. So not black rice and red? Oh, so black rice and red are better than brown, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think it's better. But, but when we're talking better, it's like 20% better, and all the like these whole grain rice varieties have like 500 times the legal limit of, of the, of, uh, 500 times the one to million cancer risk. That's how we, that's how the public health community um, their cancer benchmark is one million increased cancer risk. So if adding, um, some company says we want to add a chemical to the environment uh, or into people's food supply, what the, what the public health community wants to know is this going to increase, um, is there going to be uh, one million increased risk, like a million people eat this, okay, one person, X person gets cancer, fine, that's okay. But we don't, you know, so if there's 300 million people in this country, so a few, couple hundred extra cancer cases, dump that chemical in the food supply. Um, but if you use that, maybe you have to do it somewhere, right? Okay. Um, and so using that benchmark, then, oh my, then the, the rice is off the charts. I mean, just way off the charts. Yeah. What about rice milk? Oh, yeah. Rice milk, bad. So rice milk is a red light food now. Um, yeah, so and I, when I talk, and so then I really go into rice milk. There's all sorts of interesting things. Uh, yeah, anyway. I've got a lot of videos coming up on rice milk. Bottom line, we just want to go straight to the bottom line. Choose, you know, oat milk, soy milk, you know, a more healthful milks. Who should, who should not use nutritional? Who should not use? People with Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, should not be eating nutritional yeast. People with Crohn's disease should not be eating nutritional yeast. People with hip retinitis separativa should not be eating um, uh, uh, nutritional yeast. And you're saying, what's that? You probably don't have it. So that's good. <laughs> so that's good. But, but, and look, you you look, you watch my videos, you make up your own mind. In fact, I have a friend with Crohn's who's like, I don't care. I'm eating my mac and cheese, I'm putting it Yeah, I'll die with my nutritional yeast clutched to my chest. But, um, but look, it's totally your decision, your body, your choice. But look at the data first, and I think that there's a really, compelling enough case that uh, um, uh, people with those two conditions should not be eating nutrition yeast. But then, uh, lots of other videos saying nutrition yeast is great stuff for most people, right? I mean, it's like, uh, you know, whole grain, uh, you know, whole wheat bread, gluten, great, whole wheat bread is great for most people, but people with celiac disease, I mean, it can be horrible. I mean, people, right? Peanuts, great. If you have peanut allergy, dead. Oh, well, Crohn's disease is hydratinitis suppurativa. If your armpits look okay, you don't have it. Greg, what about peanut butter? That's a little oversimplified, but... Okay, what about Before, peanut butter? What, what yeah, about, what about peanut, peanut butter? butter? Yeah, saturated fat. So, oh, yeah, so... Should you be eating oh, it or not? So, so, no, so that's a, that's a great question. So, there are whole food sources of saturated fat, like 
So if you actually do like a nutrient breakdown, something like almonds, that's a little bit of saturated fat. Um, and so, you know, when say like, oh, olives are monounsaturated and, and you know, uh, you know, uh, animal products are saturated. And, no, all foods pretty much have a mixture. What they're talking about is the predominant. So yeah, almonds predominantly have monounsaturated, there's a little um, saturated fat. Same thing with avocados, a little bit of saturated fat. The question is, well look, um, you know, uh, you know, saturated fat increases levels for LDL cholesterol, um, a primary risk factor for leading killer. So shouldn't we want to decrease our avocado consumption or our seed consumption? Um, well, uh, let's put it to the test. And indeed, it's been put to the test. You give people um, almonds, in fact, whopping loads of almonds, handfuls a day. What happens to their cholesterol? It goes down. And in fact, you can randomize thousands of people to you get more nuts, you get less nuts. And who has a half the strokes of people that had nuts added to their diet, right? Um, so there's a randomized trial, um, trial adding nuts, um, uh, um, significantly decreased stroke risk. Um, so you can flip that around and say not eating nuts significantly increases your risk of uh, stroke. And I got a whole bunch of cool avocado videos coming up and peanuts. So what about peanuts, which are technically nuts? Um, also decrease um, LDL cholesterol and so do avocados. Avocados decrease your cholesterol. You eat a bunch of avocados, you add avocados, you die. And the same kind of graphs, you know, with that egg yolk graph, you have avocados, you can see it go down, and then you just take avocados, go back down. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What about the other stuff? So, we're talking about arsenic in wine, arsenic in mushrooms. You know why? Because what are mushrooms grown in? Chicken poop, often. Um, like here in Pennsylvania, it's a big mushroom growing state. What do they use? They use the cheapest ingredient. Anyway. Um, oh, then they use like um, drywall, which has lead. Ugh. Anyway. Um, but, but so what I talk about which mushrooms have most, which have least, and then. Um, what was that? Oh yeah, seaweed. Yeah. What about Maine coast seaweed? Right. So there's like hijiki we want to stay away from. Kelp has too much iodine. Hijiki has too much arsenic. Stay away from those two. But what about like oh, Maine coast seaweed? Iodine. Where do you get the iodine if kelp has too much iodine? Oh well, you get it from all the other sea vegetables except for kelp and hijiki. So dulse and nori and and so they had they t they tested arsenic levels in Maine coast seaweed all the various varieties and the only one was a problem was the kelp which we want to stay away from anyway. So poof, that's good. So yeah, so nori sheets are a great snack. Like one, two nori sheets, like that's my snack. Um, when I'm like, got my treadmill, I'm like, ooh. So I just <laughs> right. Anyway, yeah, great. Other questions, yeah. What about toxins in chocolate? Uh, oh. Oh, fungal mycotoxins. Uh, uh, um, yeah, my, oh, you are so talking mycotoxins. And um, mercury, I, I've heard. Oh. Yeah, no, no. You're talking about these fungal toxins. Which, oh, you know what it is? It's under oats, actually. Oh, oats. There's my mycotoxins. Um, let's see. Um, so that that's the chocolate. So we have one on some of seeds. Um, so anyway, here this is my folder of unread. PDFs. I will do a whole series of videos on mycotoxins. So there's some food, so for example, uh, Cheerios. I just found these mycotoxins in Cheerios. So these are fungal toxins that um, if you don't treat your brains well and they just let them sit them around damp in a silo or something, you can get some fungal growth and these, these funguses can be produced. Uh, so this used to be like aflatoxin and peanuts. There's no, there's no aflatoxin in peanuts anymore because now companies test for it. But if you go to like Nigeria or something where they have these conditions that allow for the growth of these, this fungus, you don't want to be eating peanut butter in Nigeria. Um, and so, but, but to surprise that you would like oat cereal, ready to eat oat cereal, had um, levels of mycotoxins. So that started me down this whole path. Oh, let me start doing the whole series of, of mycotoxin videos. I haven't read the articles yet. I don't know if it's, so small, trace amounts, we don't have to worry about it. Is it in oatmeal? Like, well, we gotta figure this out. Um, videos on their way. Tell us more about your cannabis experimentation. Oh! <laughs> so, um, uh, where, oh yeah, so as you can see, so these are all the, um, some upcoming scripts, um, and you can see there's like 20, I think 20 cannabis videos now. Um, on effects on fertility and schizophrenia and weight gain and car accidents and strokes and inflammatory bowel disease 
can cannabis cure cancer? Does it cause cancer? Um, effects of smoking on the lungs, using vaporizers, big tobacco, you name it. Um, okay, but, bottom line, oh, you know, there's actually, yeah, anyway, bottom line, yeah, it's funny, I'm like, oh, what are you working on? I'm doing a lot of cannabis this week. And they're like, what? Oh, no, I'm really, I'm like, yeah, 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 Mom, no, no. <laughs> What triggered my um, delving into this? So it's usually like you know one article that you know like that oat art, like the Cheerios article. I was like, what? I haven't heard of that. Um, so then I started down the rabbit hole. And what started it is the Institute of Medicine. So the IMM uh, was part of the National Academy of the Sciences, the most kind of prestigious medical institution um, in the country. Just came out uh, like a month ago, um, uh, 2017, on um, reviewing. Um, risk benefits of, of medical marijuana um, or marijuana period, recreational use. And I mean, you know, it's just massive thousand page document, whatever. And so I was like, summer reading. So <laughs> beach reading, the, the sand gets in the treadmill. It's really difficult to, yeah. but, uh, um, and so that's when, that's what started me. And so if there was a bottom line, it would be that um, the benefits are much less than I think is generally considered, but the risks are also much less um, than what most people, what's kind of conventional wisdom. So that's great news for the, for the recreational user that just doesn't want to get lung cancer, but not great news for the lung cancer victim who wants it to cure their cancer. What about the CBD oil? Oh, I got videos on that too. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, but the pediatric, but it looks like the pediatric epilepsy literature, that's the most powerful you know, so there's been, I don't know, there's a bit of a tangent, but you know, I mean, the reason a lot of these medical marijuana laws got passed is because all these uh, marijuana advocates were like holding up these poor little babies with epilepsy and like, look at all these terminal cancer patients. We just care about them. We're just compassionate people. Um, um, and it turns out that, and it turns out, and so, that, and so actually, so like, uh, I know some famous doc on TV did this whole series on the pediatric epilepsy thing, and it turns out that it's just um, this uh, remarkable placebo effect. So basically, you do these drug trials. So you look at t uh, typical epilepsy, um, uh, pediatric epilepsy drug trials, you can get 40% placebo response rates, meaning 40% of the kids cut their um, seizure rates in half getting a sugar pill. There's tremendous placebo effects in certain diseases like uh, irritable bowel disease and pain studies and a pediatric epilepsy. And so that's why, so when you look at these drug trials where there isn't even this like miracle, you know, uh, CBD oil kind of thing, and they still get these outrageous. And so actually, um, same thing like glaucoma. It doesn't work for glaucoma, it's ironic. But I mean, it does work for some other interesting things. But some of the kind of traditional things that it's touted for, useless. Yes? Dr. Breger, is it your thinking that... Uh, oh my God, we got a time? No way. <laughs> ah! <laughs> all, right. Um, all right, well, no, let's, let's do this. Last question, sorry, God. Dr. Right. Breger, is, is it your thinking that some of the studies that have shown that by adding fish to your diet has been incrementally a benefit? Is that a, is that a derivative of the fact that we're just not getting the omega-3s from the, the hemp, the, the chia seeds, the flax seeds? So it's a fair and absolute substitute. So, so that's not what. So that. So you're not um, accurately describing the literature. These were not interventional studies. So the population studies to show the fish eaters do better than the general population. So um, as was discussed by Kim and other things. But who eats fish? People that want to eat healthy. Right? People that aren't necessarily eating McDonald's. Mediterranean right? diet. Right. And so they're 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 eating very healthy. So there's so there's so how much is that? Fish it happens is that you're just not eating. You know, it's not like. Ha, huh, do I want, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, kind of as an entree, people aren't saying, should I have broccoli or should I have steak? It's usually like some kind of meat, and so if you're eating fish, you're gonna eat something else, which potentially could be worse. Um, so, so that's what muddies the population studies. So you can try to control for that, and they certainly have. But in terms of interventional studies, where they actually add fish to people's diets, right? And what they do is they typically recommend people eat more fish, or they actually add fish oil capsules. So there are these randomized control studies, and those are the ones that fall flat on their face, um, with no benefit for cardiovascular disease protection, which is the whole big thing, the whole point. Uh, it doesn't help with you know depression, mental illness. It doesn't help with you know, like suicidality. All these things that they, they were rewarded for, and there's a billion dollar industry for, 
Interventional studies fail to show benefit. Um, but doesn't mean we still don't need omega threes. And I have lots of videos on um, how to get that from pollutant-free sources. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>